Hello, mi gente. Welcome to our weekly hangout. And my name is Elian Ramos, and I'm ER Geek Goddess on Twitter and elsewhere. And I'm very happy to be having this conversation tonight. It's a very important conversation, as you know, uh, women's health. We're all affected by it, either directly or indirectly. You know, this. If it's not ourselves, we have women in, in every family, and. Um, uh, tonight, I'm going to be chatting about the Affordable Care Act and how it affects Latinas in particular. Uh, as you know about the law, uh, the law has been going through a lot of different um, crazy stuff um, since, the <laughs> since the first um, time that it was going to roll out. Uh, we had, you know, the, the little bit of issues with the website. We have tons of opposition, tons of misinformation out there. And so the aim of tonight's conversation is to really shed a light on the, the benefits of the law for Latinas and how we can all take advantage of it. And to discuss this issue, I have um, three other women that are key, that have been key in the implementation of the law and the rollout. Uh, and they are going to be answer all of the questions that you've been sending in since last week uh, for, um, you know, uh, questions about the, the Latinas health in particular, but also about Obamacare and the benefits. Um, first up, I have Mayra Alvarez, who is the Associate Director of Latino Leadership and Engagement. No. The associate director, I'm sorry, <laughs> the associate okay. director at the Office of Minority Health at the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm so sorry. How are you, Mayra? Doing great. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I got you and Vanessa a little mixed up. I'm so sorry about that. So, second one is Vanessa Gonzalez Pumo. And Vanessa is the director of Latino Leadership and Engagement at Planned Parenthood. How are you, Vanessa? I'm great. Thank you for allowing me to be here. And last but not least, we have Anne-Marie Benitez, who is the Managing Director of Government Relations and Public Affairs at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health. Try to say that three times fast. <laughs> yes, very well. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for being here. I know you're very busy women, and you're taking this time to, to really explain all of the benefits for our viewers. So I appreciate that very much. I want to say a little reminder before we, we start the actual conversation. Uh, if you miss any part of this broadcast, you're going to be able to see it again on my YouTube channel. And the channel is youtube.com slash user slash Elian Ramos. And uh, you're going to find the whole discussion there once we are finished here. So, girls, um, let's start by putting this whole thing in perspective. We know that there's um, about 20 million women who are being benefited in general with the new law. Uh, what is the percentage of Latinas that are going to, who, who are uninsured or have been uninsured and who are going to benefit with this new law? So I think I can start, and my colleagues, if you could join me. Um, so first, I think it's understood that more men than women are uninsured in this country, and that's also the case for Latinos. Uh, we know that under the Affordable Care Act, 10.2 million Latinos are eligible and uninsured, which means they have the opportunity to have new options for health coverage. Um, for Latinas, they represent a little less than half or about 45% of the eligible uninsured Latinos, which is about 4.6 million are the women um, Latinas that you're talking about that may qualify for this coverage. Wow. wow that's a whole lot of people, huh? <laughs> Anybody else? Do you guys have anything else to add? Yeah, I think I can just add in. Thank you for the numbers and the stats, Myra. I think also from you know, Planned Parenthood's perspective, for many of the women that we see, um, the preventative care that is covered under the Affordable um, Care Act was just really a huge blessing um, in that it helped, you know, get rid of some of the financial barriers. It allows some women who may have um, been nervous, and we hear stories all the time from women who haven't gone to the doctor in a decade or, you know, maybe forever, and particularly as Latinas, we take our kids and we take everybody else first. And so I know we're now hearing stories about women coming out and saying, 
you know, how grateful they are. And so we know that those numbers, um, thanks to the ACA, are definitely going to increase. Um, and that we'll be able to say, you know what, preventive care services covered so many more women after implementation. And so we're excited for when all that starts getting reported back. Nice. And, you know, we, we hear all about, you know, how it's benefiting women and how, you know, um, all of the things that, that women are going to be able to take out of these. But um, let's talk about uh, the Latinas in particular, you know, because we know our population has some barriers that are, you know, different from other populations. And I know that you all can talk to these because you, this is your work every day. Um, you know, so what, what are, let's talk about some of those barriers that Latinas in particular face every day in terms of healthcare and how is the ACA going to change this? So I can start and say that, you know, Latinas, you know, this is also like a, a bigger issue in regards to the Latino community in terms of just access is a big, huge issue for the Latino community. Um, and we face more of those barriers, not only in terms of access, but also um, cultural competency. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> I disagree with you, that's an issue. <laughs> Well, for, for those of you who are watching, there is a huge storm in the D.C. area right now. And so, if, you know, I'm just saying that in case we have an outage. And, you know, don't think that we just left. It's probably the, the storm outside. <laughs> but go on, Emery. Yes. So, um, you know, as one of the fastest growing demographic issues, this is a huge concern for our community. But also particularly because we uh, face a huge, you know, disproportionate rates of of many preventable diseases, for example, cervical cancer, which Latinas have faced one of the highest numbers of, of that disease. And what's concerning about it is that it is preventable. So the great thing about the ACA in terms of that is that it provides preventable care at no cost, you know, no copay. So and we can talk a little bit more of that in detail. But in terms of access to care, the other big thing that um, the ACA provides is a, a lot of um, provides funding for a particular source that Latinos like to go to, which are community health centers, which also include Planned Parenthood. And it's really the, it's like, it, it's our it's our lifeline. And the ACA ensures that there is funding for that so that Latinos have access to not only coverage, but also to providers. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, I think when we talk about barriers as well, um, as Emery said, right, we know it's financial, we know some of it is cultural. I think also in the ACA we saw some of the lead up in misinformation to the community. And so I know all of us together, we banded together, HHS, Latin Institute, as well as some of our partners in Rural America, in really trying to get rid of some of those misconceptions and myths about what the ACA meant for the community. We know we saw a lot of concern. Um, when it came to immigration status and could you apply for your children even if um, you did not yet have citizenship you know what did all of that mean and all those fears that came forward so I think when we talk about what we know as financial barriers what we know as cultural barriers there's also systemic barriers um, mm -hmm. that are particularly sensitive to our community and really um, I think as people who are becoming informed and educated and understanding what the ACE means we really have to do our due diligence and work to make sure that everybody in our community really understands how to overcome some of those myths as well. Mm -hmm. And Maida, you have anything to add? No, absolutely. I think my colleagues hit the nail on the head talking about the importance of financial barriers, access barriers, the misinformation. Um, you know, the only thing I will talk about adding on to what they said is, is really honing in on the issue of health literacy. And the fact that there are so many women, so many men, so many families that aren't aware of the benefits that health insurance really does provide. And I think like Emory and Vanessa both touched on, it's really reaching into communities where they're at that allows us to overcome those barriers and give people the benefits they deserve. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to hone in a little bit more on the, on the, you were talking about misinformation and, and things that kind of like things that the community doesn't talk about, right, um, quote unquote. And, and part of that is, you know, um, 
the, the traditionally marginalized communities. I'm talking about, you know, other women of color, you know, be, beyond Latinas, including Latinas, but also, you know, transgender women and, you know, lesbian and, and um, bisexual women. Um, and, and how is the ACA going to respond to the needs of all of these marginalized communities, including Latinas? Anyone? I can start. I think one of the most important benefits that the law makes a reality for people across the board, whether you're a woman or you're a, tr you're a transgender or you're part of a family or you're an immigrant and you're part of a mixed status family, is that it removes the fear of, oh my gosh, I have a pre-existing condition and I'm, I'm going to be turned away from health insurance mm -hmm. or I'm going to be charged so much money that I won't be able to afford it, which is what people were seeing across the country before the Affordable Care Act was passed you would see that women that were breast cancer survivors that had made this great um, triumphant uh, overcoming of, of breast cancer and they were end up turning away from health insurance or they were charged so much that they could barely afford it. I mean you saw that with children that were born with heart defects. You saw it with people that were born or had asthma. I mean for no reason they were turned away but other than the fact that they were already sick and they could potentially be too expensive for insurance companies. Mm -hmm. That is completely outlawed by the Affordable Care Act and really I think provides every person that worries about a family member, worries about their health, the opportunity to know that they can get health insurance regardless if they're sick or have been sick or are going to get sick in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, I think we also know, right, that it's an amazing um, door open for access for a large portion of the people who needed it. Um, at the same time, we know that there's still some cultural competency issues when it comes to dealing um, you know, with mixed status families, whether you're a transgender, all this mix of people. So it'll be nice to continue to have those conversations, and I think everybody can acknowledge that there has to be more work to be done to be sensitive to all types of communities. But at least now we can have some access into the health centers, and we can have access into these um, facilities that for so long people felt like they couldn't even walk in the door. And now people need to know that they have a right to go in that door. And again, you know, cultural competency needs to be a part of that conversation also. Right. And if I could just add two more things that there's so much good things in the ACA. If I can <laughs> add two more things. Um, what, another thing that I would add is that the ACA requires um, a lot of data collection. Mm -hmm. So it allows for providers and it allows for... Uh, Office of Minority Health and other entities to just see trends and what's happening. Um, so it allows more of a reporting to make sure that everybody is actually not only receiving access but quality care as well. Um, so that is in a very in, huge important component of ACA. Another huge component of ACA is that it flat out prohibits discrimination in terms of access to health care services. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's on the basis of race, color, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, sex stereotypes, nationality. So in this actual statute. So I think that's a, that's a huge historical component to ACA. And um, if you face discrimination in regards to receive to accessing health care services, you actually can do something about it. That is, that is awesome. And I, I'm sure that, I mean, you guys have been working in the community, like actually touching people and helping people understand this law in the different cities across the country. Are there any more, um, any lessons that you learned from being on the road and, and working on the rollout of these? Are there any um, maybe surprising things that you discovered in the process? Um, I think I learned um, how to push people's buttons in the coalition. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 no, you know what though was fascinating is that there's a huge coalition of us that came together, particularly for the Latino community, to get this work done. And I think there's a, a lot of lessons learned in that we can do this and we can mobilize and we can all work together and get this done for the health of our community. You know, through Planned Parenthood, we ran a really massive door to door and community outreach program where we touched over 715,000 Latinos and provided them some type of information. And it was a bilingual outreach program in total. And so what we really learned, and we, we went into this, and, and things kind of ebb and flow when you change your tactics, but what really stuck out to us was that this is a conversation. This mm -hmm. isn't just a knock on the door, here's some information, and you get to walk away. 
We had people who were staying at the door for 40 minutes, an hour, to answer questions about, you know, what is preventative care? What does a deductible mean? What is my immigration status or mixed status families? Answering all those types of questions. Mm -hmm. And then we were all able to be a part of the awesome Latino enrollment summits that we all did. And I think what we really learned from that is knowing, is learning that you have to be in the community and we have to pick a safe space, whether it was a community center, a library, um, in some cases high school and elementary schools where parents come and they feel comfortable and it's such a personal thing to talk about health insurance and your health insurance needs and then to talk about finances on top of that. I think we really learned that it has to be a safe space and so in moving forward, you know, we're going to take those with us and hopefully um, really help improve the health literacy rate to Myra's conversation about what is a deductible, um, what is all this insurance, how do I use my card and, and really help provide that information to the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as a member of the Latino coalition that uh, Vanessa was talking about, we got the opportunity to really focus in on some of the states where we are, we have um, huge strong ties, particularly in Texas and in Florida. And we learned the same thing that it's, you know, that one on one face to face conversation. Because we have to remember that th this is the first time for so many people that they've ever had health insurance. So a lot of the, just thinking about health insurance and how does it work in the United States is a very new concept for, for many, many individuals, particularly the Latino community. Um, and then one thing that we also really learned is um, navigating how to talk about it, particular, how to talk about health insurance coverage, particularly when it comes to mixed status families, because Vanessa is just absolutely right. This is, a lot of this was confidential information and people being concerned about sharing about their health, their finances, but then also the, uh, the status of where their family, uh, one's family could be. So mm -hmm. all of that is a much longer conversation and that's why that one-on-one -on -one was really important and really helping the community understand that health insurance is here and it's here to stay and you know how can somebody <laughs> access it in a real way. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's, it can be very confusing even for people who, who know about health insurance a little bit. For example, there's, there's a, a term that I, I never heard of, the, of that, in that it, it affects women very, very um, strongly. It's gender rating. How, what is gender rating? Um, and and I, wanna, I want you to, to clarify what that is because it, it obviously has affected women for a long time, and now ACA is changing it. So tell, tell me about it and how ACA is changing the whole thing. Oh, I can start. Uh, this is Myra again. Um, so just, just wanted to say one thing, building on what both Vanessa and Anne-Marie said about you know, what are some of the main lessons that we, we thought about. And I think mm -hmm. as, as a representative of the Department of Health and Human Services, one thing that we knew from the very beginning was that we weren't going to be able to do it alone. Uh, we weren't able gonna be, to meet, reach the tens of millions of people. And I think it was made that much more clear when in our work, in talking to the partners like Planned Parenthood, like National Latina Institute, getting the feedback from the folks that were on the ground really underscored just how critical they were to the work we were doing. And that the work we do on the federal level can only be as impactful as what happens on the state and local level. That we really need partners at every opportunity. So I just wanted to say that. Um, so let's, talk about, let's talk about gender rating. Um, <laughs> basically, before the law, in most states, insurance companies were allowed to consider gender when setting premium rates in the individual health insurance market. So basically, they could discriminate against you if you were a woman when they were setting how much they were going to charge you for your insurance policy. So this is specifically to that individual market. And as a result of that practice, this gender rating, the fact that they were allowed to do this, women were charged more than men for the exact same policy. And that's so, huh? Yeah, and it was a lot more. I mean, it was like 50% more of the cost, or 84%. There's some studies that say 84% more. Um, a 25-year-old woman, what she paid compared to a 25-year-old man. It wasn't fair. It, wa it wasn't a level playing field. What the Affordable Care Act did is level that playing field. So a woman wasn't going to be discriminated against simply for the fact that she was a woman. And the idea that all of us deserve quality affordable health insurance coverage at a fair price is what the Affordable Care Act is about. 
Now, insurance companies can vary premiums based on things like where you live, like geography. Um, one other thing they could um, vary it on is um, age, but now there's limits on how much they can charge more um, older adults. So it's important that that playing field is level when it comes to women and men. Hmm. Especially yeah. because, but did you want to add anything, Vanessa? I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that's where you know we say now being a woman is no longer a pre-existing condition and it never should be again. So okay. we're very. I very love that thankful. phrase. <laughs> <laughs> I love that phrase, and, and you know, especially because women tend to use healthcare services more than than men in you know than other populations because we don't only use it for ourselves we use it also for our families so can can you girls talk to me and I call you girls right right after saying that about women <laughs> but can you can you explain um, what are some of those benefits for women that, that we're talking about there's there's uh, consumer protections there's essential benefits which are different from preventive services uh, what explain all of those things for me um, I'll start and I know that my my colleagues are going to join in on some of the, the bigger issues related to their agendas um, which all of us have a shared agenda when it comes to, to women in the Affordable Care Act um, but I think one thing that's really important is that it does have new consumer protections so that you know your health insurance is going to be there when you need it the most so one example is that um, all the health plans now must not have lifetime limits on the coverage so before the Affordable Care Act, you could have like a, a million dollar lifetime cap or a $250,000 lifetime cap, which if you're healthy and nothing happens to you, maybe that's fine. But if you were diagnosed with a serious illness like cancer or God forbid you get in a serious car accident and you need months and months of treatment, you don't know what that hospital bill is going to add up to. And before you could possibly run up against that hospital bill run out of your insurance coverage and have to be left paying the bill yourself. Not anymore. Now your insurance coverage is going to cover you no matter what happens in your life. So that's one opportunity. Um, another opportunity that is an important consumer protections is um, children. Adult children can be covered up to the age of 26. That's something that's particularly important for young women who might be graduating college or might be graduating high school or might be starting a family and are really wondering where they're going to get their coverage. If they can stay on their parents' plan, that's one more option that they don't have to worry about where they're going to get that health insurance coverage. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll talk about is this essential health benefits package. I think now what people don't have to worry about is, are these services part of my plan? There's a basic set of essential health benefits, things that you know you're going to need, like emergency room care, hospitalization, uh, maternity care, rehab, lab services. Um, pediatric services, like a core package of services that you would expect health insurance to have. Health insurance to have, um, and part of that is preventive services. And I'll, I'll hand it over to one of my colleagues to talk about the important preventive services that are available. So, which one wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I can I can add in some from the Planned Parenthood's perspective and what the work that we do in particular um, to reproductive health, and so. I know obviously one of the big pieces about this is the birth control with no copay. That is phenomenal when it comes to women's health. We know that 98 plus uh, percent of Latinas have used some form of contraception uh, in their lives. And so this impacts, you know, almost all, every single one of us. Um, and so that's a really important point. I will say though with that point, what's really important is that if you do use birth control, it is a requirement to be covered, but that does not necessarily mean that your brand per se will be covered. And so it's really important that you contact whoever you went through to get your insurance with to make sure that if you have a particular brand that you're comfortable with and that you like, that you make sure that that's under your plan. But by law, no copay birth control. Um, the other thing is, again, to the preventative screening point about you know, pap smears are now um, covered, as well as testing like diabetes testing, cholesterol testing, and then cancer screenings. As Anne-Marie said earlier, uh, Latina space is very high and some of the highest rates of specific cancers in the reproductive health. And so now, if, you know, my abuelita feels sick and she feels like there's a pain going on and she's not really sure what it is, and for whatever reason, and usually it's financial or just not knowing that she can go in to get screened, 
that's a possibility now. She can go and do that and know that that will be covered. Um, prenatal care as well is a coverage um, that speaks to some of the benefits that Myra laid out in essential health benefits. And so we know that there's a lot of information to give to everybody about what you can go get now. And so we really um, are encouraging folks to give your insurance company a call, see exactly what is covered in terms of generic versus brand name, and then always come and give your local plan parenthood a call and set up your appointment. <laughs> yeah, so you hear that? No more Viva Peru, okay? No more, no more of that. No more self-medicating at home with the teas and all of this stuff. Yes. You, know? you yes. can go to the doctor and get checked out. That's, that's part of the plan, right? And yep. Marie, do you have anything else to add in terms I, of what you cover? I mean, I think all my colleagues covered most of everything. STI, STD screenings, cancer screenings, mammograms, all those preventative care services are really important, particularly because our our, our community faces those uh, those diseases at a much higher rate, unfortunately. Um, so now we have the access to the care. And in terms of birth control, if I can just add, um, I think the contraceptive coverage is a big deal within our community. There was one study of um, Latinas between the ages of 18 and 34 that said the cost of contraceptive is prohibited. So this is really going to help many, many Latinas access contraception and and a, a lot of Latinas can now plan and space out for their children and family planning. So we're very excited about all the preventative care and the essential health benefits that are covered under ACA that so many Latinas will have access to for themselves and their families. Nice. And, and when now, now that we know that all of these services and all of these things are, are available, where can you go to find out about, you know, how, how do I take advantage now that I know all of this? Who wants to, to, to tell me where to go? So, <laughs> I, think, I think we all have different resources. Yeah. No se me duerma. <laughs> no, para nada. There are so many. Um, There's many, many different resources no, that you can go to find out. So, for example, where, where is one of the websites, for example? So, one of the websites is healthcare.gov. I think that's a website a lot of people hear about when it comes to open enrollment, right? When you're ready to enroll in coverage or you uh, want to know about enrollment, go to healthcare.gov. What people also don't know is that it's a great learning tool. There's a lot of resources related to what benefits are covered, um, maybe what's like a sample cost. Like during open enrollment, there's a calculator that helps you understand how much it would cost. Um, and there's definitely information about what services are covered. Obviously, if you got coverage in open enrollment, we encourage you to double check that you actually are covered by calling the insurance company and making sure all of the processing of the paperwork has gone through so that you can make sure you take advantage of the services that you're entitled to. Um, but definitely healthcare.gov is an important resource. Um, related to preventive services, healthfinder.gov um, is much a little bit more specific, but it actually lets you know what preventive services are right for you at what point in your life. So the services that a 21-year-old woman needs are different than what a 45-year-old woman needs. And it helps you tailor your information so you, you're, you're better informed about what services are right for you. And then from us, um, in Planned Parenthood, you can go to PlannedParenthood.org or you can also go to PlannedParenthoodHealthInsuranceFacts.org which is the English site. We also set up PlannedParenthoodAsegurate.org um, which we know a lot of people have heard and the Get Covered America. And so those are two sites that we have set up that will specifically list all of the benefits and that also provide some definitions in English and Spanish and for you know basic insurance terminology as well as where to find the, your closest health Planned Parenthood Health Center. And then we also have a calculator as well and we link back to um, the healthcare.gov and Cuidado de Salud sites. So if you're watching this in English, um, you know, there's plenty of information to be provided, but there's also information in Spanish because we know that you serve as the messengers back um, to the family. And so we wanted to make sure to cover everyone, um, particularly those in mixed status families. And so there's also information regarding immigration status and how you can access that and what that uh, process is as well. Well, let's talk a little bit about that information, about the, the whole immigration thing. So what are the, the benefits or... How 
does the ACA approach mix status families? Because that, I know that's one of the biggest questions in our community. So one of the things that kind of have people a little apprehensive about the, the law in the beginning. Can anybody want to talk to that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I can speak to that. You know, one of the resources is on our, on our website. We have, uh, if you go to nlirh.org, on the right-hand side, there's an ACA section. And in there we have some um, information, particularly for mixed status families. And we try to make it as simple as possible. So for those who are naturalized citizens, you know, that's very basic and simple. They have access to exchanges, subsidies exchange. Subsidies meaning it helps you pay for the exchange if you can't afford it. Um, or you can be eligible for Medicaid and or the Medicaid expansion if it ha has happened in your state. Um, for those who are lawfully present, um, you're also eligible to purchase the exchanges and you're entitled to the subsidies. Um, Medicaid, there is a five-year wait, so um, also known as a five-year bar in terms of Medicaid or CHIP, which is the children version for low um, coverage for low income children. Um, and then there's also Medicaid provides coverage for emergency care. So, you know, in terms of a Latina perspective, emergency care can is labor. So that includes labor and delivery as well. Um, if, however, you are not lawfully present, um, if you're undocumented status, then you're not eligible for the exchange. Um, and only eligible for emergency care in regards to Medicaid. Um, however, there's a lot of community health centers, and I can uh, <laughs> let a community health center expert speak, <laughs> um, who, who doors are open to a lot of, to anybody who walks in their doors. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for that. Cue up, Amory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at Pump Head, we will as we always have, continue to see anyone regardless of insurance status, regardless of citizenship status. Um, it's not an issue. Um, we would just want to make sure to provide health care. To that point though also, when you're doing the applications, um, one of the key points that we learned in enrollment this, this last cycle was that we had to continue to tell people you only have to provide um, privilege information for those people who you will be enrolling. So for, so for a lot of mixed status families, parents only have to provide specific information for their children. Right. And that was really important. The other big piece about that was that the information provided to obtain your health care is only used to obtain your health care. And so I know that there is a lot of confusion about that, but that is the only place it goes. It does not trigger some kind of ICE um, action. It's only to provide health care. And again, you only have to provide that vital information for those that are seeking coverage. Mm -hmm. And I just actually um, published, I'm sorry, Maida, I oh, actually okay. published a memo about that, right? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that, Maida? Go ahead. Sure, sure. Um, so in, in October of last year, the Department of Homeland Security, Immigration and Customs Enforcement issued an official statement that clarified this policy that Vanessa just said about the information that you provide on your application for marketplace coverage will not be used for any other purpose other than, than to determine eligibility for health insurance. It's not going to be used for immigration enforcement. It's not going to be used to follow up on an immigration action, only for eligibility purposes for health insurance. Um, but I, I will tell you, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a technical document. It's not a document that my mom would read or have any interest in reading. So what we tried to do was use other forms of communicating that information. You know, first and foremost, it's organizations like National Latina Institute and their promotores along the border. It's uh, Planned Parenthood and their promotoras across all, all kinds of states across the country. It's really um, looking at Spanish publications like La Opinion and publishing a, an op-ed by the Secretary of Homeland Security to try and communicate this message. It's, it's one thing to have the federal government informing our families with a policy guidance. It's another to have people in your neighborhood letting you know you don't have to worry about this. People you trust, your, your priest, your pastor, your uh, grocery store attendant, the, la señora que, que te cocina tamales, somebody that you trust to say, don't worry about it. This is an important opportunity for the well-being of your family. Um, so the more people that can help us make clear that message to folks in the community, 
the more we'll know that people will be ready come November to, to re-enroll or, or if they qualify for a special enrollment period earlier. And, and that, especially in our communities, when we know that, you know, I, I think uh, beyond the, the fact, you know, the language factors and in, in all of that, we do like that, you know, one-on-one -on -one attention, when we're, especially when looking for healthcare benefits, you know. So, so let's, let's put a, a little bit into kind of a real-life case here. Um, what would be the options for, let's say, a single mom who has two kids and makes minimum wage? Let's put it like so people can form an actual idea in their heads. Anyone? So it's highly likely that that mom and her kids are going to qualify for Medicaid or CHIP. It depends on, on the state and what their minimum wage is, right, as far as where she lands in the income level. Um, but her children obviously would have qualified for Medicaid and CHIP so long as they meet all of the other requirements. Um, and she could potentially qualify for Medicaid because she's a parent or for CHIP, depending on the income level. Um, but perhaps she qualifies for marketplace coverage with a tax credit to help her pay for it so that she can not have to worry about how much it's going to cost and her kids qualify for Medicaid and CHIP because that happens. Sometimes the parents get private coverage while the kids get Medicaid. It really depends. What she should know though is that it's one application through the marketplace that sends her to all the right places. She doesn't have to worry about filling the Medicaid application and the private insurance application and trying to decipher which one is right. It's one application through the marketplace and from there the system will inform her what her options are. Mm -hmm. And so basically, go ahead, go ahead, Vanessa. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, and also online as well, if you look at the calculators um, that Myra and I mentioned, is when you provide all your data and your information, you can even do it on your phone. It will also kind of cue you up to say you may be eligible for X, Y, and Z. Um, in states like Arizona, where they do have their own um, specific program as well, you know, to the point of you, it's one application and the system will tell you what you can apply for in some instances in some states tell you what you already qualify for. And so you're not having to run around to a bunch of different um, government offices, sorry Myra, <laughs> a bunch of different <laughs> government offices to get your whole family coverage. So if, if all is well as when you're working late at night, you know, if you can get on the phone and type in your information to the calculator, that's a big first step. Very convenient, you know. And Marie or, or Myra, do you guys want to add anything? So no. I'll just say one more thing. I'm sorry. Um, so we talked a lot about the health, healthcare.gov and online, and, and I think we should recognize that not everyone is going to know right. how to go to healthcare.gov and how to enroll online and how to navigate this system, um, which underscores the importance of places to go in your community, like the local library or your community health center or your Planned Parenthood clinic, where you can actually talk to someone about this. Or you can call the call center at 1-800-318-2596 um, to answer these questions. Even now, people can still ask questions. They may not qualify to actually enroll in coverage until November, um, but they can find out information now. They can become more informed consumers now so that we're all in a better position to hit the ground running and get enrolled come the fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, you know another hypothetical. We we know that uh, there's so many there's there's as many uh, different situations as there are people, right? Um, so let's say that I move from one state to the other. And this is a question that came from uh, one of our viewers from Facebook. And this is Marta from Pennsylvania. And she is asking, can you use your Obamacare coverage across state lines? My family is planning to move soon. So if I move, for example, does my insurance move with me? Or how does that work? That it's a great question, um, and I think that's one that a lot of people wonder, like what happens when you move, right? What happens when anything big in your life occurs and something changes in your, in your personal circumstances? So what would happen for Marta is she would trigger a special enrollment period. Um, so special enrollment period is one of those technical terms that applies to insurance policies. 
Um, qualifying life event is another uh, term that's associated with these special enrollment periods. And what it really means is, is big events that happen in our life. Things like getting married or getting a divorce or having a baby or adopting a child, moving out of state or if you become a citizen or if you leave jail or if you leave prison. These are big events that obviously trigger changes in your circumstance so that could change um, or signal a change in you getting health insurance which triggers a special enrollment period. And what that means is that you have the opportunity to get health insurance, to go through the marketplace, get access to tax credits, things to that effect. And that's important because you might be able to save more money, you might be able to get a different plan that you would have wanted at a better price. Um, so it's important to call the marketplace or go to somewhere where you can um, get the assistance in person or go online and make sure you enroll in coverage under that special enrollment period. One thing to note is that you have 60 days from when that triggering life event happened to enroll. So if Martha moves to another state, um, she has to be able to enroll in that coverage within that 60 day window. So it's important to make sure the marketplace knows right away about what that qualifying life event is. Well, let, let's, let's continue with that theme because I, it's kind of confusing, right? Because enrollment already ended, didn't it, on March 31st. And so what is, what is the special enrollment? Is it something that continues? Is it something that is only in between enrollment periods? Or what, how does that work? So I'll take a shot at my rep, please correct me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, to that point, I think, right, you know, to the Myra's point that we all have life events that change, you know, getting out of prison, um, having a child, adoption, becoming a citizen, those types of things. And so the program, similar to private health insurance, right, has to be able to be flexible and to be accommodating to people. And so that is a way that if any of these things happen to you in between the period um, when you know open enrollment is closed, you still have options to enroll. Now when open enrollment opens, right, it'll happen similar to the way it did this last time, where if you qualify you'll go through the marketplace, you'll go through some of the same steps. What is important though is again that you need to um, start getting that information and do your homework now. And then, you know, if you also know that you're gonna be moving um, and you only have that 60-day window, it's going to be extremely important. And if you have children as well in a family, it's going to be extremely important that you have that information um, ready so that when you do move, that's one of the first conversations that you can have so that you don't get hung up in any kind of paperwork um, and miss that 60-day. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Wow, very important to know, huh? Right, um, so it's I would add is, you know, outside of special enrollments, right? Enrollment finished, but you still have these opportunities to enroll with all these big life events that take place, like you're no longer 26, so your, your parents can't cover you anymore. That's a huge life event. Um, but also, uh, what's always ongoing is Medicaid enrollment. So that is something that's not part of this process. You know, Medicaid enrollment is 365 days a year if you're eligible for it, and also, um, even and also particularly in states that have uh, Medicaid expansion, uh, they are also uh, Medicaid enrollment is always available. But you should be aware that if you do move to different states, and let's say you're on Medicaid, um, but you move into a state that didn't have Medicaid expansion, you may not be eligible for Medicaid in that other state. Like in states like unfortunately where um, a large portion of Latinos live, like in Texas or in Florida. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's good to get informed before you do any of these uh, big moves, right? Um, I have another question that is, it keeps popping up. This one is from Jennifer and she's in Texas, actually. Um, and and um, her question is not necessarily for her, but she's asking um, for the people who, who do get um, who do get the ACA, who do get Obamacare, how does one find out if one qualifies for a subsidy? How, how do you know if you qualify for a subsidy? So actually it's part of the application process. Um, so if she is applying for coverage in the marketplace and puts in her information, 
she obviously has to put in her name and her residence, but also has to put in income information. That verification of her income information helps the system determine what she qualifies for. So earlier we were talking about that one application for both Medicaid and private coverage. That This is similar. We want to make sure that if she qualifies for tax credits to help it make it more affordable, that she knows that. But also, if she qualifies for Medicaid, she'll also know that. So it's important that she's an informed person. And the system, whether it's her online and looking at her options, or her on the telephone talking to someone, or her next to a promotora or an in-person assister walking her through the application, that income verification allows the system to better understand and her to better understand what type of financial assistance she'll qualify for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know that when we saw people enrolling in person, um, there was hesitation about um, the subsidy and what does that mean or is that really good. We have just told everybody, you know what, just fill out the whole application. Let the system mm -hmm. see how and let it work and let it see what you're qualified for. And what we were able to see is in states, I know I saw personally in states like uh, Florida as well as a couple of others, um, including Arizona, People who are really nervous to come in, and particularly when the thought of a subsidy, what does that mean? They were walking away with health insurance for their family for $40. Um, we had some cases of people who were walking away paying $10 a month, and that's part of the subsidy, and that's part of the assistance. And so to know that peace of mind and to be able to say, I can make that, I can make that payment of $10 a month to cover my family, I, there's just nothing more invaluable and all you really have to do is fill out the application and if that if you have questions if for some reason there's a glitch or you're not able to complete the application to Myra's point about there are different ways there's different help and dis different assistance to get that done and you can always go in person let someone know that you started the application process and here's what happened and they can pick it up from there and help you Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And so, and there, you guys mentioned briefly um, that there are some states that have restrictions on on women's health. What can the ACA do, if anything, to help the women who need healthcare in those states? Is there is there anything that that the women can do? Any anyone wants to talk about that? Um, so I can, I, obviously the, the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010, right? So it was a law that was enacted in 2010 and we're implementing it now. Mm -hmm. um, so one, two of the things that we've talked about already is making that health insurance coverage more affordable. So those tax credits, it doesn't matter where the state lies as far as their support of the Affordable Care Act. If they hate the Affordable Care Act, if they love the Affordable Care Act, that health insurance marketplace is in every single state across the country. Um, sometimes the state itself is running the marketplace, but sometimes we, the federal government, are stepping in. So all of those women still have opportunities to get health insurance coverage, not be worried that they're going to be charged more because they're women, have access to tax credits to help make it affordable, and in some states that choose to expand the program, they have the opportunity to access Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Right. That's great to know because the, the, I think that's another point of confusion for, for mm -hmm. certain people, you know, that they, they think that the states that don't want to expand Medicaid or something like that, they don't have it available. So it's great to know that it is available in, uh, in most states. And, I, and if I can point to one resource, I know that because there's so much confusion about what state has restriction for women's services, you know, can I really have access to contraception? Uh, well, the answer is yes, yes, yes. Sometimes you get nervous about how do you talk to a health insurance entity that speaks a completely different language. Um, the National Women's Law Center actually has a really good kind of like a toolkit for women on particularly accessing women's women's services. Um, that is a really great resource to go to, um, particularly if you're deter you're, you're denied services that you think you should have access to, or you're paying copays where you're wondering shouldn't this be covered under the ACA? So uh, the National Women's Law Center has tools and, and ways to respond to that, even sample letters of how to talk to your health insurance company. It's a great That's resource. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, you know, and, and speaking of things, like there's so many uh, um, actual benefits that are written into this law that are not the 
you know, I think most people know about, you know, the, the contraceptives and, and those kind of things, but there are there are other benefits that are necessarily the most advertised. For example, I, I found out that there's a, a special, there are special education programs um, for, for younger women. Can you talk about this? Um, where, how do we access those kind of programs? Anyone? Um, I don't. Um, hi. Uh, <laughs> I, don't what, I don't know what program you're specifically yes. referring to. Yeah, but this one. But I do agree that there's uh, definitely other resources available. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that we haven't talked about is um, teen pregnancy, and obviously mm -hmm. it disproportionately impacts the Latina community, right? That's exactly um, what I was talking about. <laughs> so, oh, oh, okay, yeah. It's then yeah. Healthy <laughs> teen initiative. Um, yeah, but I, I, I have a teenager, and I did not know that. There was this this kind of service available. So yeah, exactly you make a it. great. It's a great point that a lot of the focus of the Affordable Care Act has been on health insurance coverage and what it does for health insurance. But it also supports a lot of important programs in communities. You know, one example is run out of the Office of Adolescent Health at the Department of Health and Human Services, and that's the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program. Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, they support evidence-based teen pregnancy prevention program models so that we know that the program we invest in is going to make a difference in the lives of these um, teenagers that uh, don't want to become pregnant or are at risk of becoming pregnant. Um, it offers uh, e-learning modules and podcasts and webinars and training materials for those organizations that work to reduce teen, pre teen pregnancy. And we also have a pregnancy assistance fund that's funded through the Affordable Care Act um, that's run out of our Office of Adolescent Health as well, as well that again tries to create these opportunities to, to give grants to communities to support these programs that will offer the services to these kids um, these families that really want to to prevent teen pregnancy, um, but there there's more. There's investments in prevention, in community-based prevention. Um, there's investments in delivery of health care, and how are we working to ensure that we're delivering quality health care at, at at a lower cost? Because that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about reforming health care. It's not only health insurance, but it's how we use care, what type of care we deliver, making sure it's culturally competent, like we talked about earlier. Um, the, the discussion around improving health care, not only for ourselves, but for our country, continues as the Affordable Care Act gets implemented. Mm -hmm. And speaking of, of you know, benefits, we, we are talking about benefits that have already started. Uh, now, but I know that there's um, some other benefits that will be implemented in the future that haven't yet um, been rolled out. Can you can you speak a little bit about what are those benefits that are that are coming up? And uh, anyway. <laughs> So most of um most of the things that uh, that we talked about are now, Eliane. Like a lot of times, people are like, "Oh, it's in the future, it's coming down the pike." No, no, no. These benefits are alive um, and well today, and actually, many of them have been around for years. But we want to make sure. I mean, how many of us know someone whose kid has been able to stay on their policy because they're you know older than 23 but younger than 26? That's been around since 2010. Um, you know, these preventive services have been around for years, the, the idea that they're free. So again, you know, when we talk about insurance coverage, we're not only talking to the people that didn't have insurance, the uninsured, we're talking to the people that had insurance whose coverage is now better because of this law, whose coverage is now more secure because of the Affordable Care Act. And mm -hmm. that's an important message to everyone that says, oh, the Affordable Care Act isn't about me, it's about those people who didn't have insurance. No, it's about all of us. We are all one serious car accident away. We're all one serious diagnosis away from a lifetime of financial hurt. And now that our insurance is more is stronger and we have the right consumer protections because we are put first, we're in a better position to lead healthy lives. And that's because of the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. And um, what are some of the things, I know, you know, we we all trying to push, it, it's been such an amazing thing to see the coalition all working together to push uh, the rollout forward to make sure that more people get, um, you know, get coverage and get information that they need to, to get coverage. 
Um, what are some of the, the things that you're going to continue doing within the coalition to reach out to even more people, the people that, that maybe did not um, enroll this time around? So one of the things that we're thinking of, or that we are going to do and that we're planning um, with the coalition is similar to the way we did the Latino Enrollment Summit, if, if anybody went to those. Um, we're going to be doing some literacy town hall, essentially, that will not only provide information on the special enrollment period, but also things to think about while you're gearing up and what you're thinking about, um, special things to take in consideration so that when the next enrollment period opens, you already got that list ready, you know what you need from your health care provider and your insurance company. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be providing that. We'll also, um, at some sites, and we're still selecting the cities and dates, so we'll release that to the world as soon as all of that is finalized. But we're also talking about basic things, again, like handouts on the terminology, the definitions of what does this insurance mean, how do you use your insurance card, and, and really importantly, what are your rights under the ACA, as well as if you feel like you are being mistreated or that you're not being provided a service that you, you thought should be covered, how do you best advocate for yourself? The other important component of that will be uh, fraud, because what we did here in going door to door is we would knock on a door as Planned Parenthood and we'd be there with our information and our shirts on, our names listed and ready to help a family, and they would say, oh, well, somebody just came by and I gave them $30 to help fill out the application. And we know that our community in particular, again, never having had health insurance, um, never having somebody knock on your door to help you with the federal program, um, it's a it's a good situation for fraud. And so we're going to be really working hard as partners to combat some of that as well. And then immigration status, what it means for your children. So we're going to really just be providing a lot of information, answering hopefully a lot of questions, and trying to get the community ready for the next enrollment period. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of getting ready, you know, what, what is your call to action? What can people do to start getting ready for when the next time around comes? And I, I know we're, we're almost leaving, so I want to give you the platform to, to really tell people, you know, where to find you, where to connect with, you know, more information, all of that good stuff that you guys know and love. Who wants to go first? Uh, I can go first. Um, so, you know, nlrh.org is where we have a lot of our resources and our information, particularly for our mixed status families. So we do a great deal to try to educate the community that um, there is health care. Um, and, and then for two other um, big call to actions that we're working on and trying to continue to lift up is uh, one of them is thank those governors who did have extend their Medicaid expansion, but in states that are not, please to continue encouraging your governor to consider Medicaid expansion because that is something that is going to impact the Latino community, particularly in the states of Texas and Florida. Um, and then another thing to uh, keep building on the ACA, um, we along with coalition partners, along with Planned Parenthood, have introduced the HEAL Immigrant Women Act to um, ensure that more and more people have access to health care coverage. Mm -hmm. Maida? Um, so I think just to reiterate a couple of resources we mentioned before, healthcare.gov or in Spanish, cuidadodesalud.gov, de chica, um, as well as the call center at 1-800-318-2596. Those are all resources that continue to offer important information, whether it's just trying to find out more information about what the marketplace is, or to find out if you qualify for a special enrollment period. Um, those are important resources to give you more information. I also um, encourage folks that are watching this conversation and that work for organizations like health centers, like hospitals, um, any uh, lots of businesses that want to get trained to become an in-person assister. That's an, a possibility. We encourage you to become an in-person assister, a certified application counselor. Get that training because really we are all resources in our communities. We don't have to work for a healthcare organization to help our loved ones, to help people um, get through this process. Even if it isn't um, something that you want to do 24 hours a day or as your profession, find out about opportunities in your community to help out this important cause. 
um, the responsibility to get our community members enrolled really is something we are we can all take part of. We can all continue this conversation about the importance of health care, the importance of health insurance. Talk about it with your families and your friends so that people aren't wondering why it's important, um, that people know the, the security, the peace of mind that comes with it. I think we can all play a part in making that conversation come to life. I agree with you. Vanessa? You know, for us, I think one of the important things is as a woman, um, particularly as a Hispanic woman, making sure that mm -hmm. you take the time to investigate and look at what services are available to you. This isn't just about your family and about getting your husband to finally go to the doctor's office. This is really about making sure that you you really take that time because as the mothers and as the leaders of the family, if you're not well, that affects the entire family. And so on the website, you know, if you even Google Planned Parenthood and the ACA or Planned Parenthood and Obamacare, um, you'll come to our Planned Parenthood Health Insurance Facts.org in English or Planned Parenthood Asegurate in Spanish. And both of those sites provide not only essentially an interview guide for you as you're thinking about what insurance needs you need, as well as some of the basic things that all women should be looking for when they look for health coverage, as well as the cost, cost calculator. Excuse me. And then, of course, if you need the in-person assistance, where to find your local um, Planned Parenthood Health Center who will be able to provide that assistance for you in person, walk you through what are some of the services that are available to you. And then of course, from our end again, I can't reiterate this enough, regardless of your health insurance, regardless of your citizenship status, you're almost w more than welcome to come to the Planned Parenthood Health Center, not only to find out the information about Obamacare and ACA, but also to provide, to get services that you need. Awesome. Well, there you have it, folks. You have all of the information that you need. I'm going to be posting all of this information on my blog with more details so you can find it again and you have time to go through all of the different links that um, these beautiful ladies have been sharing with us tonight. I'm going to um, to close up shop now because um, it's, it's, you know, we ran a little over time here because we started a little late. But I want to uh, thank you for being here, all three of you, um, Anne Marie, Mayra, and Vanessa, and thank you for you know sharing all of that information. It, this is a really a very uh, complex uh, topic, and and you sharing all of this information, especially for Latina women um, who are one of the populations that need it the most. Um, I want to make sure that um, all of you um, know that I appreciate very much your time here. And uh, for you who are viewing here, thank you so much for watching. This is the first Hangout of a series that we're going to be holding all throughout the summer, um, talking about different aspects of the, of the law and different populations, different topics that have to do with the law. Next, um, the next Hangout is going to be uh, in two weeks, and we're going to be talking about men's health. This time was the ladies first, right? Um, but then, the next time we're going to be talking about the men in our community uh, whom we know that we have um, some kind of trouble getting them to take care of their health as well. And so um, it's going to be another set of uh, people. Um, but in the meantime, I want to say thank you very much to these ladies and good night to all of you. You are going to find this Hangout again on my YouTube channel, which is YouTube dot com slash user slash Elian Ramos and I see you all next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.